Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks to the Institute for inviting me to, to moderate this important panel. It's a great honor. It's also something of a burden because this panel could itself be the subject of a two-day conference, but we only have an hour, so I'm going to be a, a benign autocrat and try and keep things moving here. Um, the, the subject is the Abraham Accords and the Saudi-Iranian thaw. And it's a very interesting subject in that these are two diplomatic trends that should not be happening at the same time, at least not in theory, and yet they are. And so we're going to try to unpack that. Um, why are they happening at the same time? Are they really happening, or are they just rather superficial? Is there something going on uh, below the surface, or are they not likely to last? These are the questions we're going to explore. We have four uh, very, very good panelists. I'm going to ask their indulgence. I'm not going to read their biographies. You have them in front of you. It's more important to hear what they have to say than to hear me read what's in front of you anyway. Um, I've asked each of them to speak for about 10 minutes. That's a tough ask, and, uh, but I will uh, try to hold to that because what we want to do is to, to end this and give enough time for a bit of audience engagement at the end. So uh, the first person who'll take the floor is Joel Gozanski. Yo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to first thank uh, ICB uh, for inviting me. Oh, I'm sorry. Now you hear me? I want to again thank Eunice and IPD for inviting me. This is my first time in Canada, so I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm going to speak about the Abraham Accords. Uh, we now just celebrating three years anniversary, uh, and I'll at the end speak of at the one minute that I got left on what, what is next. So a three years anniversary, if I was an historian, I would have said that this is not sufficient time uh, to say, uh, to, to give evolution or evaluation of, of things, but I'm not, I'm a political scientist, so I, do, I have no, doesn't have any choice. My uh, uh, report is a mixed one. I will start with uh, the glass half empty and then move to the glass half full. Uh, I have six points on each, and I'll try to do it as fast as I can, Peter. On the glass half empty, three years to the Abraham Accords. Number one bullet, no Palestinians. The Abraham Accords, the process has failed to produce improvement in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. For some, I guess, a blessing. Uh, that was the intention perhaps, uh, in the first place. For others, uh, like myself, a missed opportunity. Uh, so this is the one uh, that I wanted to start with. The second uh, glass half empty bullet is there's no domino effect yet. So far, the Abraham Accords failed to bring other members, other countries in the region, other uh, um, neighbors of Israel, to join uh, the Accords. Uh, in fact, one member, uh, Sudan, de facto left uh, uh, the, the agreements because of internal circumstances that you're all uh, familiar with, the internal instability inside Sudan. Uh, number three in the glass half empty, there's no tourism, uh, tourist um, so far, uh, it's only a one-way street. Na basically, what I'm trying to say, that despite the interest of the parties, the governments, in promoting tourism, uh, the flow of travelers has primarily been one way. Uh, what I'm trying to say is there's only mainly, or mainly Israeli tourists uh, going to Morocco, especially to the UAE, uh, and a little bit to Bahrain. Um, over a million, million and a half Israelis, if I'm correct, went to Dubai so far since the Accords uh, were signed. Uh, only about 2,000 Emiratis, even less, in three years, uh, came to, uh, uh, to Israel. Even less so Bahrainis, and it's unfortunate. Uh, number four in the glass half empty is popular opinions. Uh, sore mood of Arab publics towards normalization with Israel continues uh, in the region. It's not you. It's not new. 
uh, and there is even a decline in support uh, uh, for the Kurds in the last year or so. If you check uh, your colleague, David Pollack, is, is someone who checked this uh, for many, many years. And if you, and I'm following what David has uh, been written in the surveys and polls that he's been conducting in the Arab world, and one can trace a decline in support in Arab countries, even in the Gulf, even in the Arab Gulf, even in countries like UAE and Bahrain, for the model uh, of the Abraham Accords to normalization uh, uh, with, uh, with Israel. I guess one uh, uh, trying to explain that uh, is expectations. Perhaps publics expected more of, of this peace, of this normalization, enjoying the fruits of peace and didn't get as they expected. Number five uh, in the glass half empty is Iran factor. Tehran is getting stronger, unfortunately, uh, in the region and is trying to drive a wedge uh, between Israel and some of its new old partners in the region. You all mentioned before uh, the detente, uh, I like to call it a detente in the region. It's underway in the last few years uh, from the Abraham Accords to the uh, Saudi Iranian, uh, Saudi Turkish, UAE Turkey, Egypt Turkey. The entire region is talking to one another, trying to diffuse uh, conflict. It's a detente because it's not deep. It's not tackling the root causes. It's only on the surface. And maybe one day we'll again, uh, unfortunately, uh, we'll have to deal with the root causes. Uh, so Tehran is getting stronger and trying to drive a wedge between Israel and its uh, uh, partners uh, while everybody's hedging their bets. It's, it's, I think, much harder for Israel to try to sell the narrative that it used to sell. And if you hear Israeli politicians in the last few years saying, it's us Israelis, the Arab, against the common enemy, Iran. It's much harder to sell it right now after we see the Saudi-Iranian rapprochement, other Gulf countries getting closer to Iran. Out of necessity, there's no much love in the air, we all know that, but out of necessity, out of strategic and, and defense requirements, uh, they do that trying to keep their enemy closer to them, I think it's much wiser. Uh, I can talk about it later in QA. Uh, the sixth and last factor uh, in the glass half empty uh, is the Israeli government. I work in a think tank so I can speak freely. Uh, there is a cooling effect on the normalization. If I can check normalization when I do regularly, uh, uh, at least in the last six months, maybe eight months since the entering of the new government in Israel, the, the far-right government in Israel, uh, some of its policies and activities affected negatively uh, this, this process. Uh, I can count uh, canceling of visits, uh, freezing some um, joint projects, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, even it, it's got to do with popular opinions. This also, I think, uh, 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 the bright side, by the way, in this is uh, the accords uh, were proving their durability. Even with this far-right government, uh, the country is never canceled and everything is continued, uh, if not publicly, but under the surface very smoothly. So there's a joint interest in keeping the uh, six fast bullets on the glass half full. Now I'll, I'll be optimistic a little bit. Normalization between Israel and its uh, partners in the region uh, is the new normal. If you ask Israelis uh, flying to Dubai, flying to Bahrain, flying to Morocco, maybe soon to Saudi Arabia, it's, it's, be, it's, be, it's becoming normal. And this is, a, this is a blessing. This is good for Israelis and perhaps for Arabs uh, as well. Uh, it looks natural to connect to one another. I think Israel gained more legitimacy in the region. Uh, uh, it wasn't zero, but it wasn't 100%. It's not 100% now, but I think it's a scale. And if you, if you check it, it's hard to measure, but I think Israel gained a lot of legitimacy uh, in the region. Uh, the eighth uh, bullet 
on the glass half full is the security reason. And like Clinton used to say, it's the, it's the economy stupid. I would say it's the security stupid. Uh, the basis for relations for many years, the Abraham Accords are perhaps the tip of the iceberg, but relations between Israel and some of its partners in the region go back decades ago. And they were based on security interests and security rationale. Uh, uh, they were tested before, and now uh, some of it, it's more open. Security continues, and it will actually growing due to shared threats. And also another very important factor that people don't really mention a lot, we talk about the Abraham Accords, but another uh, very important uh, development was Israel joining CENTCOM. I'm finishing. Israel joining CENTCOM uh, two years ago. Uh, which actually facilitate much more easier to Israel uh, to cooperate uh, militarily uh, under the U.S. umbrella with its neighbor. The tenth factor is a question mark. Uh, perhaps the U.S. is back. American involvement was key and is still key to any progress. Until now, the administration, the Biden administration, was a bit passive in the last two years, but now things are changing for the good. We'll see, we see more proactiveness thanks to China. Uh, people to people, uh, the Accords uh, offer a new model, uh, I think, to the region, a more warm peace, if I can uh, compare it to the cold peace that we have with Jordan and in Egypt. I'm very optimistic. Textbooks are changed, are beginning to be changed in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, less anti-Semitism in those textbooks and hatred toward Jews, and things are uh, uh, changing inter-religion dialogue between the sides. This is very encouraging. The last point, and I'm finishing, Peter, uh, is the 12th point on the glass half full is Saudi Arabia. And there's a question mark, is Saudi Arabia coming, joining the Abraham Accord? I personally think that Saudi Arabia signing a, a peace agreement or normalization agreement in Israel will be on a different model. It will be a Saudi model, not the Abraham Accords model for, for different reasons, sensitivities of the kingdom, custodian of two holy places of Islam, different story whatsoever. It has a huge potential, uh, but very high price, very high price, both to the U.S. and I think for Israel. Uh, uh, and I'm talking about the nuclear, I'm talking about the uh, conventional weapons that the Saudis are asking, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Yoel, for starting us off so substantively and on time. So we appreciate that very much. Our next speaker is Dania. Thank you. Thank is this working? Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. And thanks for the Institute uh, for Peace and Diplomacy. Uh, special thanks to Bijan and Yunus. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to discuss uh, great power competition and how that affects the calculations of regional players, namely the GCC, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Iranian thaw and the Abraham Accords. So after, the, after World War II, the US and Russia vied for influence in the Gulf by attempting to reorder uh, the region along the lines of their broader ideological visions um, of how the international system should be ordered. Now, uh, with multipolarity on the horizon, it has be become more of an issue-based transactionalist engagement, um, a challenge uh, to the rule-based order and democracies in general, general. And this is obvious uh, when looking at the democracy deficit in the Middle East. And in this context, context um, China and Russia became more appealing as partners uh, to the Gulf states. Also in this context, uh, there are five ways um, that great power competition and multipolarity have affected the GCC state's calculations vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran and Israel. The first is this, trends of, this trend of uh, transactionalism is also occurring uh, at the regional level. Um, ideologies such as Arab nationalism or different forms of political Islam are not really uh, driving forces in uh, framing national interests of uh, the Arab Gulf states. Um, the main 
driving force framing interests um, are economic imperatives, and, and this has led to a trend of de-escalation um, in the last couple of years. And uh, the third uh, point that I would like to bring up is that during uh, great power rivalries, rivalries, there is generally uh, a vacuum of power. Um, and in the current context, uh, security considerations take precedence over other concerns, such as ideological battles. Also, uh, there's a rise of South-South cooperation. Um, this is the fourth one. Um, regional states, not only the GCC, but Iran and Turkey, have talked about diversifying relations beyond the West and, and underscoring this point that they, they believe that Western countries are unreliable partners. And I've heard this from several countries uh, uh, across the region. Um, and the fifth is there's a critical juncture um, expedited by the process of strategic autonomy, uh, that expedited the process of strategic autonomy um, uh, for the GCC states to take advantage of, of opportunities pertaining to multipolarity. Um, and this critical juncture was the Ukraine war. Um, this uh, conflict increased the leverage of petro diplomacy, uh, shoring up uh, the geostrategic economic uh, position on a global scale, causing more autonomy for the GCC states. And these factors amalgamated uh, together uh, have caused the GCC states to become non-aligned, if you will, and view themselves as middle powers um, in the international system. So with this transactionalism and these, the economic imperatives of these countries, with security taking precedence over other concerns, along with the, the rise of South-South cooperation and increased strat strategic autonomy, these are all a recipe for a political logic that makes it more appealing to reach out to regional rivals or foes, such as Iran and arguably Israel, so how does this relate to the Abraham Accords or uh, detente with Iran? Well, there's a culmination of items that led to the thaw uh, with Iran and outreach uh, to Israel. So the devastating effect of COVID-19 on the economies of, of countries across the region, the end of the Arab Spring, um, diffusing, which diffuses rivalry across the region, um, a concern about the U.S. commitment in the region. There's a strong perception of U.S. disengagement. And um, the GCC states have gotten to a point where they realize that maximalist policies are really not uh, the best option in this period. And it's time to settle scores and be more pragmatic. And due to the changes in uh, the global order, and domestic imperatives, the GCC states have been diversifying their security arrangement and seeking alternative uh, partnerships. Um, for some GCC states, the Abraham Accords and others thawing, uh, thawing relations with Iran is, is part of this strategy. Now, the new strategy with Iran is containment of Iran through engagement. Um, in general, uh, I would like to underscore that each GCC state has its own strategic calculus when it comes to Iran and own national interests. Uh, that should go, I guess, without saying. However, um, the general sentiment is that all of the GCC states, deep down inside, aspire to temper Iranian expansionism. And uh, right now, it's being done through uh, containment through engagement. Uh, and Saudi Arabia has also changed its strategy a little bit. Um, it's disengaging from conflict, primarily for the sake of its 2030 vision and redefining itself more as a peace advocate, if you will. And Iran, for a long time, has been looking for regional dialogue between regional actors, to kind of sideline the US. Um, and both these interests converged and we had the Chinese uh, broker deal uh, between uh, Saudi and Iran. And this, this deal uh, arguably has increased uh, Chinese influence in the Gulf. Um, and if it does remain in intact, um, there, are, uh, there is potential to temper rivalries 
um, maybe through some interdependencies between the two countries. Iran has a lot of benefit from this deal, um, especially economically. Uh, it, has in, it does need some relief for its struggling economy. And from Saudi's perspective, it reduces threats from Iran um, in the event of a conflict uh, to ensue between Iran and Israel. Um, some tangible results, we saw talks with the Houthis, but I don't know, today or between today and yesterday, two Bahrainis were killed at the border of Saudi Arabia. So there's some concerns about that. Um, so simultaneously in this contest, Saudi is also strengthen, strengthening its regional position as a strategy uh, to counterbalance Iran. Um, so we saw uh, outreach to Turkey. Uh, we saw the Abraham Accords. The big question mark, uh, will Saudi be joining the Abraham Accords? Uh, or normalizing with Israel. It has developed military to military relations and tactical cooperation. Now, going to the Abraham Accords, um, in reference to great power competition, normalizing between um, Saudi Arabia and Israel has potential to impose uh, distance between Saudi Arabia and China in a way that increases US's influence in the region through offering a nuclear program or some sort of defense pact, uh, which is very questionable and concerning from the national defense strategy of, 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 of the US right now, but we'll see. Um, it's interesting to note um, that those states that have tense relations with Iran, ha or historically tense relations with Iran, have developed more ties with Israel, whether it be all out Abraham Accords or covert relations. Um, Saudi Arabia, the UAE and, ba UAE and Bahrain uh, view Israel as a country that deeply understands uh, their threat perception regarding Iran. And the Abraham Accord could serve as a partnership between some GCC states and Israelis against the challenge posed by Iran. The Saudis want to deter Iran through the Abraham Accords uh, with a defense pact uh, with the U.S. and the civilian nuclear program. So as you can see, they're, they're thawing relations with Iran, but they're also watching their backs when it comes to Iran. So um, how does the Abraham Accord deal affect Iran? Iran is worried that um, greater convergence with the Arab Gulf states with Israel could cause compromise in its influence in the region. And in terms of if a deal were to be reached between Saudi and Israel, where the Palestinians have an amenable agreement to them, it would dilute the effect of Iran holding the banner of Palestine to increase its influence in the Arab world, um, even arguably the Islamic world. If Saudi went forward with the deal with uh, unsuccessfully advancing the Palestinian cause, then that would make Iran stand out more as a supporter of Palestine in the eye of the Arab world. In conclusion, um, changes in the global system has led to more autonomy and leadership among the GCC states as middle powers and caused them to diversify uh, their security partners and seek alternative alliances or relations, including through the thaw with Iran and the Abraham Accords Agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Dania. Our next speaker is David. Thanks, Peter. Um, so um, I spoke a little bit earlier today, and uh, many of these topics uh, of, of today are overlapping. So please forgive me for repeating what other people have said uh, once again. Um, I'm going to throw out some data points. Um, the pivot to Asia, we talked about this before during the Obama administration. Um, during, the Trump, uh, during the Trump administration, we had the May 2019 um, scuttling of, of uh, ships in Fujira. We had uh, the June 2019 downing of the $150 million U.S. drone, the Global Hawk, uh, in international waters in the Persian Gulf uh, by the Iranians. Um, we had uh, the Abkhaz attack uh, two months later in September 2019. Um, all these. Um, of course, uh, Fujira, Abkhaz, and Global Hawk, there, there was no U.S. response to. Um, although, I must say, uh, on one occasion, we were very close to responding militarily. 
and uh, uh, the president seemed to get cold feet. Um, and then in January 2020, there was Qasem Soleimani um, being taken uh, out of the equation. Um, uh, we've had troop rotations in and out, equipment. Um, uh, the Biden administration, uh, first two years, Mohammed bin Salman as a pariah, there was a hold up on offensive sales of, of offensive weaponry. Um, there was uh, two weeks before any senior U.S. commander showed up in Abu Dhabi after uh, the February 2022 attacks. Um, this is something that is known in the Emirates as their 9-11. Um, all these, um, just highlighted for the, our Gulf partners, um, what they understood as not only disengagement, but lack of U.S. commitment. Um, raised and, and solidified these growing questions of United States reliability as a security partner, whether we would keep our, keep our security commitments to these countries, um, and whether we had what it takes uh, to prevent, to actually prevent at the end of the day, Iran from becoming a nuclear power um, with a nuclear weapon. Um, so all these things dovetail together and bring us to where we, we are today. Now, in the course of, uh, of this, we reached the Abraham Accords, um, and this is incredibly productive. We've had um, CENTCOM coordinating um, uh, regional um, actors under, um, under their umbrella that include, uh, to include Israel, but also Bahrain, um, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, not Qatar, um, but um, the United Arab Emirates, um, all together to talk about not only um, potentially a shared radar picture, um, uh, but potentially uh, missile defense, joint missile defense, and a productive strategic dialogue on the Iranian threat. Um, along the way, you've also had uh, with, uh, uh, and of course, I, I didn't mention Morocco uh, attending these events, but also Morocco having um, an incredibly uh, forward leaning uh, and productive uh, burgeoning um, strategic relationship with Israel uh, that involves training as well as procurement of almost half a billion dollars worth of contracts so far to purchase advanced systems from Israel. Um, and yet, um, with this, we also have um, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates um, changing the nature of their relationship with Iran. Uh, and, uh, now, I, I said earlier, I viewed this um, as an insurance policy. This is an insurance policy because notwithstanding uh, the getting closer to Israel um, uh, in many ways, um, there's a question about uh, where the United States stands and whether they'll do what it takes. And so they're playing essentially both sides. They're doing a regional de-escalation um, with Iran, but also Turkey. Um, and even we saw um, as a, a goodwill offering uh, the re-embrace of, of Syria into the, the Arab League. Um, and I, I think you know part of this is uh, uh, related to um, the overall uh, view um, of um, where the United States stands, but it also it goes further. I mean, the Biden administration is not at all hostile to Iran, right? The Biden administration uh, isn't enforcing sanctions against Iran. Um, they um, are really looking very much so to re-enter a deal. There's no more maximum pressure. Why should Saudi and the Emirates be hostile to uh, Iran, when the United States is looking to um, have a de-escalation with Iran. And as uh, we've heard before, the priority for Saudi Arabia is Vision 2030. That is this incredibly deep um, economic, social, uh, economic diversification, social change, um, trying to attract tourism. You can't have that when you have Iranian proxies lobbing missiles into Riyadh. Um, this is, you know, an ambitious um, priority for, uh, for Saudi, um, but this is the main goal. And to get there, um, they can't have the Houthis doing what the Houthis were doing. They needed an end to the war. Uh, as a bonus, they might have uh, the Iranian-backed uh, Hashid 
uh, militia in Iran, uh, sorry, in Iraq, stop targeting them. Um, but really, beyond that, it doesn't go much further. Uh, with Saudi Arabia, you're not going to get, sorry, with uh, Syria, uh, they are a narco state. They are not going to change from being a narco state. The captagon will continue flowing. Um, and of course, uh, you're going to get nothing on the Lebanon front from Iran as part of this de-escalation de de either. Um, but this is, I think, a, a collaborative effort by, uh, by Iran. It, it's, uh, it is, uh, sorry, uh, it is a, a policy uh, that makes sense for Saudi Arabia and for the Gulf uh, at this time. And at the same time, um, they're moving forward um, with uh, some degree of normalization with Israel. Once again, we've got five or six months to see if this works. Um, they're asking for, um, I think, uh, 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 really um, uh, a remarkable number of things along the way, um, but they are all, each and one of them separately, um, doable. Um, they're asking for what Iran got from the Biden administration, that is uh, a blessing on the right to enrich uranium. Um, I think it's going to be very hard for the Biden administration to stand in the way, um, regardless of, of where the Israelis are at. I think they will agree to that ultimately. Um, they will um, uh, get more, will ask for more, than what the Emiratis asked for on normalization on uh, the Palestinian front, and uh, the Israelis will be required to do more on that. Um, uh, it's unclear, actually, whether that will be the Biden administration asking for more or Mohammed bin Salman asking for more on the Palestinian front. Uh, in any event, the ask will end up being bigger. Um, this is an increasingly confident Saudi Arabia um, and increasingly confident um, United um, U UAE, um, both domestically and uh, in terms of foreign policy. Um, and I think um, this is reflected um, in how they are dealing um, with the prospect of, of normalization. Um, I don't want to belabor um, these points here, but we have, with this increasingly confident um, Saudi Arabia, um, it changes the nature of uh, relationships, traditional relationships with the West. And uh, I, I believe this was also mentioned earlier, but um, you know, with the great power competition, with um, with um, uh, the um, with other options available, um, multipolar world, um, Washington, the West is really going to need to modify and recalibrate, recalibrate its approach to Saudi Arabia. Um, this is a, a, a middle power with um, broad regional ambitions and a, and a heightened sense of, of confidence. And it's operating in a, in a new, a dramatically different regional context. Um, you know, Egypt is not a regional player anymore, right? Egypt is going to be lucky not to go, to, go bankrupt. Um, and so the focus, um, global focus, regional focus, has all moved to the Gulf. Um, and so uh, this presents us with, uh, with opportunities, uh, but also challenges. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our last speaker <laughs> is Masa. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm going to second all the thanks uh, <laughs> so that I won't go through it. Um, I do have to give a disclaimer that what I share with you today are my personal views and based on my personal research and do not represent views of National Defense University um, or U.S. government. Um, a lot of uh, the issues that I was thinking of share with you have already been brought up, and I'm going to just give a little bit of a different angle and like a quick summary of uh, what we have discussed maybe. Um, when we think about this kind of the taunt or sort of this evolving pieces, I think what's really important is that 
this is happening because of a level of uncertainty surrounding several important global issues. The first one that we discussed, I think, extensively um, today is the issue of, uh, we can call it great power competition, or uh, I would rather say it in, in the regional perception, uh, a change in global world order. And I, and I would argue that it's not clear how the change will happen, when the change will happen, whether it's going to be to bipolarity, multipolarity. Um, but I would argue that the expectation mainly in the region from what I see is not uh, it's gearing towards a global system which is not necessarily about polarity, but it's a global system where it allows for nation states um, to, uh, to basically exert themselves depending on their power, their geopolitics, or more of an anarchical system. And that gets me to the point where has been a very um, point of grievance and contention, uh, particularly by the countries in the region, about this idea of international rules-based order and has been particularly aggravated by Russia's war in Ukraine and, and the, the way the West has handled it from their perspective in which there are good guys and then there are bad guys and you've got to take a stand and be with us, um, et cetera. And so this goes to many different uh, international institutions and systems. I could call many, but the, the one that I generally work on is MPT. And with how the changes in the world are happening, for instance, um, and, and uh, the future of kind of arms control, disarmament between US and Russia taking a grim stance, then there would be other countries uh, rethinking what we have for a very long time thought of as a rules-based order and what it would look like and the implications. And another major element of that is this idea of democracy versus authoritarian, right? Um, and how the countries deal with it. And, and, and we heard rightly that they much prefer to, to have transactional deals that will not be jeopardized by anything related to their domestic politics or um, other, other issues um, that come up. Second um, uncertainty is um, the future of Iran's nuclear program. And there, there are lots of talks about sort of Iran and US and, and how this is going to go, but the, the reality is I think everybody expects that, um, again, it would be a few years of transactional at best. And so we would have levels of uh, high potential for conflict, and then we would have, uh, you know, episodes like the prisoner swap, um, at least until uh, the next U.S. election, and that's kind of what the expectation that I'm hearing from the countries in the region is. And so that requires them to prepare again and gear up and diversify for a situation like that. And the two, uh, the two last factors I mentioned kind of combine in um, the last point, which is the uncertainty around U.S. role in the region, right? So um, there are discussions about the pivot, which I would argue actually there was a pivot before the Obama pivot <laughs> during the Bush administration when the concept started, but Obama introduced the, the, the term. Um, but nobody knows when and how it's going to happen and, and what the implications are. And there's a lot of discussion about U.S. role in the region. Is it declining? Is it perception? Is it fact? But I want to point out one thing, which is it's not about how much forces U.S. has stationed in the region. It's really about uncertainty around U.S. strategic intent to when to act and when to restrain. And because of that uncertainty and the high possibility of conflict that these countries see for either Iran, U.S., Iran, Israel, Iran, Israel, U.S., they need to be kind of, as we talked about, covering their bases, diversifying um, their strategic portfolio, et cetera. And I add one more point that I think we haven't discussed today, which is there is, I think, strategic competition or great power competition um, held before the Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, what the countries should prepare for our kind of thinking about is a great power conflict. What would that look like? Whether it's Russia or the Taiwan issue has become very uh, on, on top of everybody's list. And if you're sitting in the Middle East and predicting that there might be rising conflict between US and China, 
you would think that you're perfectly situated geopolitically, economically, in terms of your relations. So you want to prepare for that scenario because you will become essential to both powers and that will protect you. So that's another aspect that I need, um, I, I think we need to talk, you know, think about and, and, and talk about and prepare for it. I'm not going to get into um, Iran-Russia relations, but I'm happy to answer questions um, uh, in the Q&A. And I end with a point where all of these uncertain factors, I think, that, are, that have been the underlying conditions for these developments that we see in the region um, could easily fall apart if either of those factors or uncertainties evolve in a particular way that is not desirable for one actor or the other. So think of it as like a domino effect. It could, it could very easily just all fall apart. And the reality is, I think um, you all mentioned that um, the root causes are not addressed. Um, but I also add that it's, uh, it's kind of the, the, the way the global system is moving and uh, it, it seems like we would be more uh, going towards an era of arms race rather than arms control. So all the major security issues will potentially just um, get kind of more and more contentious in the region that they would compete on this. However, to end on a positive note, um, I think it's still, uh, there's a lot of potential and promise in this uh, era where I would call just the, the countries st stepping back and taking a pause on escalating the conflict and, and, and kind of analyzing their surroundings. Um, the dialogues that this is and, and opening up the channels that this has facilitated and fil will facilitate um, will come handy even if all this falls apart and we will heading again towards the conflict because it allows for better understanding of each of these countries' perceptions of a different world order, their th threat perceptions, and their strategies, and I think that would be crucial to avoid uh, at least miscommunication and miscalculation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we've had four very rich, very diverse presentations. Um, I'd like to open things up. We have about 15 minutes, so we have a bit of time for, for some engagement. <clears throat> um, I'd like to ask you to ask a question and to keep it brief and to introduce yourself. So over here. Sure. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Timothy Caldas from the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, the rapprochement that's been happening and the de-escalation in the region. And I think Eunice's point about the economic incentives for doing that are quite clear, uh, as well as t leveraging and taking advantage of kind of um, newly independent positions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some of the regional powers. But I wonder also to what extent has the last decade of kind of failed military ad adventurism on the part of really everybody in the region uh, also contributed to that. I mean, the, the effort in Yemen didn't, didn't achieve the objectives that were set out. Uh, the blockade on Qatar also didn't really deliver to the extent that they were hoping. Uh, and uh, on top of that, Iran, even though it might have been uh, tactically doing well in some theaters, ultimately still was left isolated and economically weak. So it seems that a lot of the kind of hostility and tensions and competition didn't deliver uh, a lot of material progress in terms of interest. To, to some extent, do you think that also is just a reevaluation of where their strengths lie and where they don't? Thank you. Why don't we take one more and then we'll open it up. Thank you so much for your comments on the panel today. Um, my question is regarding, um, my name is Sabika Zara. I work for the federal government of Canada in the foresight uh, agency called Policy Horizons. Um, so we're looking at uh, the role of technology in shaping the world order that's, that's you know, a, a, where we're standing from. So um, I'm curious to know what what your thoughts are regarding the impact of the technological competition that's happening between the great powers and how is it impacting the Middle East specifically? Um, and also that technology comes embedded with values and ethics. So there are ethics with and values within technology. And we see two blocks emerging, two or more blocks emerging actually, with respect to the digital sort of ethics and values around the world, use of data, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Where, which block does the Middle East seems to be sort of, you know, posturing towards more closely? So thank you. 
Thank you. Would any of our panelists like to have a go at either of those two? Or shall I nominate someone? Why don't you? I'm going to take a bite out of, out of Tim's question there. Because um, I actually disagree. Um, we said, sort of just to encapsulate, um, you know, didn't the sort of failed military adventurism lead us to this obvious conclusion that we needed de-escalation de because it wasn't working? <clears throat> I would argue that the Iranian efforts over the past decade have been enormously successful <clears throat> if you look at the results, um, which is that basically they planted a militia in Iraq. They grew that militia to the point where it has captured the state. It's now getting an annual budget of more than $3 billion, has its own military college. Um, you know, they, have, they control the government now. And they are able to transform Iraq um, into Lebanon. It looks increasingly like Lebanon to me. That's a, that's a big success for uh, Iran. They're not rolling it back. Right, they they may be de-escalation for the time being, but they are they just got awarded their own company, and so they're on this model to go with the Revolutionary Guard in Iraq. Um, in Yemen, all right, the Houthis were an indigenous organization, but they were provided with the material support, the know-how, the expertise, um, and succeeded in capturing ha at least half the country. They're on the border with Saudi. They they took all the blows from the Saudis. And uh, five, six years later, they are there. They're going to negotiate um, a solution to a conflict where Saudi pays the Houthis salaries in perpetuity um, in an extortionary arrangement. Um, and, they, and, and, and Iran is on now on the southern border of Saudi Arabia. Great success. Um, you know, Hezbollah, et cetera. It goes on and on. And in return, all Iran had to do, the, the clerical regime in Tehran, was immiserate its own people, which they don't see as a failure, right? So it works out very well for them. Um, so I, I think, you know, in the end, they're getting a good deal, and certain areas are going to be outside of the de-escalation. Assad can stay in power. He can put down his next uprising on the coast, uh, kill all the Druze and Soweda if he has to, and send all his captagon abroad. That, you know, that, that's like Iran's agenda. And, um, by the way, um, Hezbollah can do whatever it's going to do vis-a-vis -vis Israel and, and other Saudi partners in Lebanon. Um, so I think it worked out actually pretty well for Iran in the end. Peter, can Thank I? Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually agree with everything you said. You pose a question and then you answered it yourself. Uh, I, I want to mention a few categories. Um, there is a detente. I mean, it's, it's quite dramatic if you look at the Middle East and past three, two, three years. I, my gamble is it will, it will uh, take a, a decade. So if the last decade was a decade of ideology, civil wars, this is a decade of detente. Uh, so let's meet in a few years, see if I'm, uh, I, I was correct. Uh, th the notion of countries trying to lower conflict, diffuse, realignment, we all uh, agree, hedging, uh, they, every country in the region prefers now economy, diplomacy over conflict. The strict distinctions from the last decade. On the state level, countries, rich countries, want to fulfill all kinds of initiatives, sometimes megalomaniac uh, initiatives uh, uh, with the rich countries. The poor country want to fix the economies, broken economies. Uh, we had the Turkish uh, uh, deputy foreign minister. Turkey rapprochement with the region was uh, because uh, it wants that. Uh, so this is on the state level, and the countries want to look inward. On the regional level, many countries, be because they fear Iran, Iran, want to get closer to Iran, try to keep to keep it run uh, in, in checked, and, and uh, um, because they fear uh, Iran is getting closer, they also fear an Iranian, American, or Israeli clash, and they want to keep distance from that. On the global level, there's the American factor uncertainty on, on U.S. policy and they're trying uh, to hedge their bets. What Israel thinks about this phenomenon in the region? Because some of Israel partners are getting closer to Iran. Uh, I think there's a lot of blessing, actually. Uh, if Saudi Arabia is more secure because uh, it has relations now with Iran, not 100% secure. I don't think the Saudis trust the Iranians 
uh, to change, but they diffuse some of the tension. I think this is good for Israel, because Israel is a Saudi partner, a quiet partner so far, but this is good. If Saudi Arabia is getting closer to Hamas, this is better. I prefer Saudi influence uh, on Hamas than Iranian influence on Hamas. If Syria is getting back to the Arab uh, League, I think this is good uh, for Israel. So, uh, so the detente, many of my colleagues were fearful and said, oh, this is bad for Israel, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think it's that bad. Thank you. I think Daniel wants to come in on this question of whether a decade of failed initiatives has led to the detente we see now. And then I'll ask the panelists if they want to engage on the question of the role of technology. So, Well, fr from the perspective of some of the Gulf, Arab Gulf states, uh, uh, there was, it, it doesn't look like a failure. Like, for example, the UAE, the primary goal um, during the Arab Spring era, if you will, was to, to defeat uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and, uh, and uh, increase their influence across the region when various capitals across the Arab world were failing. And uh, the UAE was very successful in that, love it or hate it. I mean, uh, uh, that was the case. So um, I, I think the Arab Gulf states feel that they've gained more power and, and, and after this era of conflict, rather than they lost power and influence in the region. Um, but be mindful that the, the, the side of the Yemen f war is, is, it looks like that Saudi Arabia didn't win on its front. And, um, and, and uh, uh, even though the UAE has met some of its objectives towards the south, which has actually caused more conflict between uh, Saudi and the UAE, um, so I don't think they view it as a total loss. I, I believe they looked at that period um, as, as a, a maximalist period to gain as much as they could. So once they, they reached the negotiating table at this point, they could kind of uh, cut their losses and gather uh, whatever they've gained. Can I add a fatigue and failure of some of the countries in the region, we need to ask the, our, ourselves the question, is it a real change in, in, in actors, in, 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 in states, or just the means are different of engagement? So Mohammed bin Salman is uh, uh, less prone to use conflict and, and war to get his uh, objective. He will use diplomacy now, but it's the same objective, perhaps, uh, at the end of the day. This is not the end of the process. You, you hear of, of, of uh, uh, Egypt and Iran, and so you have uh, more things to come in this detente that will last a decade, remember. Uh, uh, and the, 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 uh, the, the end of the thing that I want to say, the last thing, Saudi Arabia is in the middle of, in many ways, in, of, of this process. Riyadh is trying to shape uh, the region and its, its interests, so it's, it has a, now a normalization with Israel. Uh, with Turkey, Iran, Yemen in the south, within the GCC, with Qatar. So everything, I mean, the center of many of those, the gravity is, is Riyadh in many ways. Thank you. Does anybody want to have a go at the question on the role of technology in shaping the world and the region and the values it brings? It's a fascinating question. I'm not sure this particular panel is, <laughs> but it's a very thought-provoking question. Anybody want to have a go? You know, um, the Emirates are doing a lot with China in development of AI. Um, and if you're working with China, um, it has its own implications about where you stand on the technology. Um, we've already seen, in any event, all the other hacking stuff that's going on in the region. Uh, the, 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 you know, hard to say, I don't think that's determinative of, of where they stand. That's just plain old, old school sort of authoritarianism. Um, but um, on the AI stuff, I, I think that's where you got to look on, on who the who the partners are. Yes, uh, that is a very intriguing question, um, and this is an important one for some of the Arab Gulf states, especially uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, and uh, the, they both have been very strategic in developing. Um, institution, uh, institutions for innovation-led developing uh, development and harnessing uh, their their um, young uh, human capital uh, with innovation, and I think that's very important. And I actually just wrote a book about this, but more about domestic politics and innovation-led development. 
But what's interesting in the UAE, um, the localization of their defense industry. Um, and they, they have been signing agreements for technology transfer. And part of this is a, is, is a response to feeling that they are overly dependent on um, other international players for, for uh, their defense technologies and plus harnessing uh, their youthful uh, human capital. And this has, has, has caused them to have more outreach um, towards Asian countries. And also, um, from the U.S. perspective, part of the national defense uh, strategy is to increase innovation, engage, engagement with the Gulf states um, uh, in the region through innovation. Um, and through partnerships. And I think that's something also interesting to look at in countering um, uh, China's uh, uh, commercial and technological role in the region. Thank you. Um, I'm going to abuse the prerogative of the chair to ask one more question, and then we'll draw things to a close. And my, my question really it relates to Iran-Saudi relations. And uh, can they survive in the absence of a renewal of the JCPOA or some other form of, of constraint on Iran's nuclear program. I very much enjoyed Dania's point about containment through engagement. I thought that was very interesting and something that needs to be further explored. And if it is the objective of the Saudi diplomacy to contain Iran in some way, or to, uh, diplomacy as an aspect of that, I mean, if we are moving towards a region in which both Iran and Saudi Arabia will have some form of nuclear capacity, maybe latent, maybe sort of the classic bomb in the basement, whatever, not going across the line, but everybody knows they are close to it, then what's going to be required to manage that is diplomacy. Very sophisticated, ongoing diplomacy. That's what the Cold War required between Russia and the U.S. And so maybe there's just a recognition, and I put this to the panel on the part of the Saudis and others, that if that's the future, they're going to have to start learning how to engage each other on a continuous basis um, over these kinds of issues. And I wonder if that's perhaps where some of these things are going. So I'll ask the panel to comment on that, and then we'll draw things to a close. And I'll ask them to comment very briefly, because we're almost done. So why don't we go from one end to the other? Did you want to comment, uh, Yoel, or no? On, on Saudi-Iranian uh, uh Rapprochement, I'll say it uh, again, as I said, it's a detente, it's on the surface. The two of the countries, of each of its own reasons, are trying to diffuse uh, tension. Uh, I'll talk about the Saudi uh, uh, objective here. Uh, as I said, keep your enemy closer. You call it containment by dialogue, the same thing, a different name. Um, I think the Saudis are trying to even offer Iran some carrots. They really want to maintain this uh, cold peace with Iran. If you hear the uh, Saudi Treasury Minister in the last few months, he's actually offering investment in Iran. The two countries are exporters of oil, so the trade is not really uh, something that they can do. But uh, Iran is really looking forward for Saudi money. Is that possible? That will be the day. I mean, I would love to see uh, uh, that. But at least the Saudis are offering that, trying to bribe their way into uh, peace and quiet with the Iranians. As I said before, they don't trust the Iranians. They know they don't live in Europe, in Western Europe. They know it very good, better than us, who Iran is. Uh, they live close to Iran. They suffered Iranian uh, attacks on them. They don't expect Iran to change, but they're trying, I, I think, to defuse. The correlation between normalization with Israel on one hand and Iran on the other, it doesn't really have to contradict. People said, again, uh, I'd argue with, my, with some of my colleagues when, when they saw the agreements were being signed, they said, oh, this is the end of uh, Saudi-Israeli cooperation. And, and I said, no, for the Saudi interest is having both. This is hedging. This is pure hedging. This is what the Saudis want. They think they can maintain both. Actually, in many ways, it's easier to go to normalization with Israel after you, you normalize relations with Iran. You diffuse your south and east uh, flank, and now you, you try to do better uh, uh, with Israel, or everything to serve one big purpose, and this is 2030, and this is, this is Ben Salman wanting to be king. This is all trying to diffuse tension around Saudi borders to look inward. Thank you. Um, so 
uh, I, I, I think that, yes, Saudi Arabia is definitely uh, wanting to reach out uh, to Iran and have good relations with Iran, as everyone has underscored. Mm -hmm. There's still a deep distrust. I think to, to stress test this situation, I think to watch what happens in the Yemeni war. Uh, obviously, the, the Saudi-Iran relations cannot stop the Yemeni war because the, the Houthis are an indigenous group. But, also, but it could stop the uh, missiles coming over into Saudi Arabia, which is something very important for their 2030 vision. And I think that's an important tr stress test to see where it's going. Um, uh, so we have some steps forward, a couple steps forward, one step backward. Um, also, the Ad Dora field, although that a, a, could be a, a Kuwaiti issue, but it's also a concern from Saudi Arabia. And so th that's something to watch as well. Um, but definitely, um, the appetite in Saudi Arabia is, is to continue engaging Iran and try to move forward uh, with their 2030 vision. Since I'm going to moderate the next panel, I'll address the nuclear part of your question then to save time. Yeah, the answer is all about nuclear. Um, I'll say that as long as, you know, as long as Iran is at 80%, or 60% and above, and sometimes reaching 80% enrichment, um, you know, you better make friends with these guys um, because they are, you know, uh, getting closer and closer. And if there's a doubt that the United States isn't going to solve the problem and that Israel is not going to solve the problem, uh, then you better be friends with Iran or you better be prepared to make your own nuke. Or at least have the ability to or talk both, to them. David, or, or both. both. Or both. And have the ability to talk to them. Okay, I want to thank the panel on your behalf. It's been a very interesting hour. It could have been two days on this subject, but thank you all very much and thank you.